Devolution Security Podcast. Sec throwback episode. Hey everybody, welcome to the show. Another great one for you here in the holiday time of year. I'm uh, Brian here, of course, with Eric and Aaron. How you guys doing? Man, doing wonderful, guys. It, it, I would say that's a little bit surreal, Brian, because you and I are typically close, but being that uh, my wife and I have moved to North Carolina, you know, man, I've been missing you, brother. You know, so oh, yeah. it's all... You- all all three of us. Are, you could are, not have moved much further away. I will give you that. <laughs> not and stayed in the U.S. anyway. <laughs> yeah, it's a long dang way. Um, I'm doing great too, guys. Wonderful to see you guys. And, and I'm looking forward to having a nice conversation here. Like you said, here in the holiday season, everything's kind of laid back. And I've had a real nice time. Um, just, I'll tell you, sometimes... Sometimes people ask me, what, what are you hoping for for Christmas? I'll tell you what, my favorite part of Christmas is is hanging out with my family. I know that sounds kind of kind of cliche, but that is the 100% truth. So I don't think awesome, it's cliche dude. at all, man. That's great. That's legit. How about you, Eric? Didn't you have some company, buddy? Well, um, you know, folks in the audience have probably heard me talk about that we were moving soon. And, and of course, I just mentioned a second ago, well, moving to North Carolina brought us only two hours from our son, Nick, who is, of course, a Marine, and he has a new wife. Um, they have our grandson on the way, actually could be born any day. Awesome. So we're, we're super pumped about that. But more, more importantly than... And some of that is the fact that I haven't seen Nick in two years. You know, when I was deploying Iraq this last year, he didn't get his leave form um, signed before I deployed. And so, yeah, it, it's been two years since I've seen him. But I forgot it had been that long, man. Yeah. Dang. Holy cow. Yeah. yeah, it's crazy. And then so we met his his wife for the first time had an unbelievable time as family and man I, I mean I, I get emotional thinking about how um, how special it was and man it's uh, it's awesome being that close to them very cool very that Merry is Christmas an awesome opportunity for you yeah, yeah Eric, and, and, go ahead. I was just gonna say that that's so cool two hours man when, when you're used to when I am used to you living all over the place and I can't just jump in a car and go see you, having that opportunity to take a two-hour drive to see your son or vice versa, that, that's awesome. But I'll have to say this, instead of 36 hours to go visit you guys, if I was to drive up to um, Washington, instead of that 36 hours, I think it'd take me about 12 hours to get to you in North Carolina. And Eric, that means 12 hours to get here, punk. So <laughs> that's right. That, that, that That's <laughs> well, a, I, I don't mind. I mean, lately my family has been going on vacations where we're going on about a 12 hour drive. And you know, that's not a short drive, but it sure as heck um, is more doable than 36 hours. For sure. Uh, that's oh, and believe hall. me. Yeah. After, after just freshly, driving 3,000 miles. It took us six days. We were driving about eight, nine hours a day. Of course, that's with stops, you know, letting the dog go to the bathroom and us stretching. Man, that was that was a brutal trip for sure. But uh, glad, glad to be here and also really glad to be hanging out with you guys. I mean, just because we're at distance doesn't doesn't mean all that much. We just... And we just had to travel a little further to get together. But, man, we're still the same old Evo set crew, right? Oh, yeah. We're planning some big stuff, too. So We do have Open. some big stuff. We don't have any announcements yet, but there's some, uh, there's some stuff in the works. So Yeah, there are. Yeah. Well, 
good to just catch up with you guys, but we got a big guest coming. We got uh, Mr. Tom Givens is going to be our guest this show and awesome that Eric just finished his instructor development course with him. So they get to chat about that a little bit, but we'll bring you some of the little rap that we always do up front real quick. And of course, if you did not catch episode 39, um, that has Pete Roberts, the founder of origin. And as you know, we love origin. We support origin. I take origin supplements daily I am wearing Origin underwear right now. That might be a little bit too much information for get some of you. Some, <laughs> get some underwear. They are comfortable. <laughs> I have uh, I have their uh, rash guard. I have their spats. And, you know, that stuff is all made right here. And that is the biggest deal, man. Those things are, and the fit on those things is incredible. They yes, are so sir. comfortable. These are the only underwear I have ever owned that do not roll up when I pull my pants up. Yeah, amazing, nice. So I may have to get me a pair of those. I don't know why I should try think about that. You should try them out. But uh, of course, you can go to originmain.com. Uh, Evosex is going to get you. Uh, Evosex ten will get you ten percent off. I just can't say enough about their stuff, man. I am uh, currently taking. Uh, the krill oil daily because my doctor wanted me to yep. do more of that for my blood pressure. So I'm taking that three times a day. It doesn't taste funny. It doesn't smell funny. And honestly, uh, for krill oil, it's very affordable. If you look at the other options, it's a very good, very good supplement at a very good price. And, you know, just happened to be enjoying a uh, Dak Savage tonight. I uh, enjoy all the flavors of Go, but is that a new flavor? Uh, no, Dak Savage has been out for a while. That's the dark cherry flavor. And uh, the Afterburner Orange is the new flavor. I actually have some of that in the mail right now. It's not it's not here yet, but it's on the way. So I'm going to try out that new flavor. Pete was talking about that last week, too. And, uh, you know, I think Eric is going to share something about uh, Tentacore. Well, but, before, but, before he says yeah. that, I want to st- say something about the the show, the last show with, with Pete Roberts. A new buddy of mine from jiu-jitsu, a guy named Mel, he told me today that he, he listened to that episode with Pete, and he said, man, what a great episode. I really enjoyed it. And he goes, um, I enjoyed that so much, I just had to go online, use you guys' discount, and get a pair of jeans. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, nice. Yeah, I thought that was really cool. So if we're helping um, get get people into origin gear and – and checking out how amazing their stuff is. That's really cool. Yeah, that's awesome. And I'm, I, I, that's the jeans and the boots are on my list. I haven't ponied up to pull the trigger yet because I've been spending some money in other locations, maybe in the air. Yep. <laughs> but, <laughs> Literally. But, uh, you know, Eric's going to share some stuff with you about Tentacore. But before he starts, I wanted to point out this last week, um, Craig Douglas made a post on Facebook with a with a tentacore uh cartoon yeah i did do, do you guys remember what kind of gun was in it oh it was that's where this was yeah i think it was a glock 43 yeah. wasn't <laughs> it 43 i believe <laughs> it was a sig 365 i just had to throw it out there but of course eric's gonna talk about <laughs> Tentacore, but if you if you're friends with craig and you know that and you've seen the post they had a really trick uh shivworks labeled mag holder on there that is oh, yeah. just, just that just clamps the body of the mag and and is just basically a clip it is so cool N- neo I'm, mag i'm, I'm, I'm gonna have to it. go find me one of those yep. again not a sponsor but a product that uh, obviously it, just seeing the fact that craig has it would lead me to believe that it's worthy of owning so anyway i'll turn it over to you cool. man well, and and I'll digress one more second too. Is that I wore uh, my origin gi today, or one of my origin gis today at jujitsu. Got to get on the mats nice. with with a newer gym that I'm checking out, which I can talk about in awesome. accountability. Yeah. So yeah, it was a, it was a lot of fun. Um, amazing people here, as they are back home in Washington. Washington's still my home right now. You know, it's my supplanted home, but. Um, as far as Tenacore goes, I, I want to kind of quote something out of Tom Givens' uh, concealed carry class uh, regarding the importance of quality holsters. 
Quote, since your pistol will likely be in the holster when you need it, the selection of the holster is almost as important as selection of the handgun itself. And that hit me hard um, thinking about uh, the fact that, you know, I, I talk to people about holsters and I'll recommend Tenacor, um, you know, every single time. But it's amazing to me sometimes people cinch on quality gear. Um, we would just like to encourage anybody out, out in the audience that may be on the fence of, of spending a little more money on a holster and or a belt, so on and so forth, is buy once, cry once. And frankly, ten of course holsters are very well priced. Um, I just think that that sometimes folks they see cheaper options online and 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 they go for that. We want to encourage people to buy gear that is hard tested, like ten of core test their gear in in gun grappling and all the ECQC type classes and all the stuff that that uh, Jeff and his people do. They know how gear is supposed to work. So please check them out at tenacore.com. EvoSec at checkout get you 10% off. Go out there and buy a holster for um, family members, even after Christmas is over. Hey, buy an extra Christmas gift. Christmas isn't over yet, right, guys? That's right. That's right. Oh, yeah. In the so, spirit of giving, man. Amen. Yeah. Hey, hey, Brian, you just hit it on the head. Folks don't have to go out and buy holsters. Sometimes we just need to pony up and 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 gift you know sometimes i do that on a fairly regular basis but i need to oh I for need sure to do that and i well. that is that is something that is i've actually had to do with a couple close friends of mine to get them to kind of change their ways and get off the serpa or you know sorry blackhawk but <laughs> you know they they they're running whatever that they bought at a gun show or whatever and it's like you give them a quality piece of gear and they understand the difference once they run it because they just when they look at them they look they look like the same thing but when you physically mount it holster it use it draw from it carry it you will notice the difference that's right well and and guys if i can take just a moment and aaron i'd like you to kind of go into our spiel about reviews here in a second uh but I want to really highlight, I'm holding in my hands, um, Tom Givens' newest book, Concealed Carry Class. I absolutely love books. I got hundreds of books, um, thousands maybe, but let's face it, sometimes we have to streamline what we choose to educate ourselves with, especially in the walk of of self-defense. And I think I can single out just a handful of books. And as of recent, I have really grown to love this book it's a newer book but it is a quick reference guide of everything you need to know regarding armed defense all the way from uh let's just point out a few factors in here um you know tom goes obviously into why we carry which everybody that that will get a little bit of this in the interview he commands statistics in the real statistics legal issues with carry principles of self-defense he hits on jeff cooper's color codes um you know i can go down the list but i'm, I'm going to encourage people in the audience to go out and buy this book you can get it on amazon and various other sources um tom goes in the holster selection just like i was hitting on he talks about towards the end he goes into realistic relevant practice goals, smart goals, um, and at the very end, courses of fire. I mean, courses of fire, and there's only a handful of them, but they're bullseye courses, they're um, um, range master qualification courses. Folks, if you if you get one book on your self-defense platform, armed self-defense, get this. So I just wanted to point that out, guys. Good deal. Nice. No, good Good choice, man. So, Aaron, why don't you share with us uh, a little bit about what people should do if they feel like they're getting something out of this show? Yeah, guys, we we certainly, everybody out there, we certainly uh, appreciate the listeners that we have, and we're just blown away by the support we've received over the last year and a half that we've done this show. But we we are a 5 
star rated show on on iTunes. We're real proud of that, but you know what? We would love to get more reviews. We would love to get more reviews and ratings. So if you could please swipe down and give us a rating and a review and make sure that you share this show with your friends and family, we would really appreciate it. And again, you if you don't listen to iTunes, um, you can get us on basically every podcast platform out there. So yep. take a listen, share us, and give us a, a rating and a review. We appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Well, let's hop into this interview with uh, Tom Givens, man. Yeah, let's do it. Hey, we'd like to welcome Tom Givens for the second time on our show. How are you doing tonight, Tom? Fine. I'm glad to be here. Awesome. Happy to have you back. Well, obviously, if you want to know a little bit more about Tom, besides what we're going to discuss tonight, you can uh, roll back to episode 36 where we had him on. But just as a quick reminder to our listeners, Tom, tell us just a, a brief bit about who you are and what you do. Okay. Well, I've got a strong law enforcement background, but I've been a full-time trainer since 1996. Uh, a lot of competitive background was involved in setting up IPSC and IDPA and won state and regional championships in both of them, uh, been through all the institutional schools and trained with just about everybody in the private sector. And uh, as I said, for the last 25 years, been training full time. Awesome. And that is uh, you and you started training in 75. Is that correct? Yeah, I started teaching uh, as a side side kick uh, part time basis in 75 and went full time in 96. Oh, man. Impressive. Very impressive. Well, You're stubborn. <laughs> there you go. Well, I'm going to turn this over to Eric because Eric had the pleasure of taking your instructor development course. And uh, that's kind of what we're going to center today's show on is about Eric's experience with that. So, Eric, I'll hand it over to you, man. Thanks a lot, brother. Well, well Tom, first all, I'd like to start out with thank you so much for an incredible experience. You know, I I knew that the course was going to be outstanding, but what I got was much, much more. Um, not only was it an incredible learning experience, the group of the group of shooters, man, I, I felt humbled to be amongst such awesome shooters. And uh, your teaching modality, the way that your building blocks went together, was just phenomenal. And I really appreciate and thank you for that experience. Thank you. Appreciate the kind words. So we we did have some really good shooters, did we not? Yeah, uh, your class was typical. Uh, there were uh, half a dozen active law enforcement, uh, a lot of private sector trainers, uh, people that are what I would characterize as serious students. Uh, the, the course has got a reputation as such that uh, we don't get a lot of what I would call you know low end students that don't have a lot of background experience and. Uh, so it, it makes for a, a better learning experience for everybody, and uh, everybody comes in with a fair degree of skill and leaves with a bit more. Yeah, absolutely. And I have to, I have to say for the audience, so they know, I definitely um, was not at the top. I, there were guys much better than me. Like I said, I was, I felt humbled um, to to be amongst the crowd, and, I, and I'll mention um, some of the top shooters' names towards the end. But I, I kind of wanted to summarize. It's, it's real difficult for us in this setting to, to discuss and debrief every bit of the course. And really what we're, we're hoping folks will do is obviously um, seek out the course and, and, and take it. But I'll try to hit on some of the highlights, which I think that the audience members will get the most out of. And so if you bear with me, um, I'll, I'll try to enumerate a little bit of it. So for the audience... Um, the course is a is a pretty intensive three day course. It's split equally between classroom and live fire. And to kind of start off, obviously, uh, Tom hits very heavily on the four cardinal safety rules. And Tom, one of the things that I really loved about the way that you emphasized the safety rules is you say that these are lifestyle rules, not range rules. Can you kind of hit on that a little bit? Because I think that is 
is one of, obviously it's one of the most important aspects of firearms training is safety. But can you can you hit on that? Yeah, that's kind of one of my pet peeves, really. Uh, unless you work on range, you don't spend a lot of time on range. Your typical student has a real job. He's got a family. He's got a lot of other responsibilities. And and the truth is, in, in a typical year, he might be on range, you know, half of one percent of his time, if that. So having range rules seems kind of silly to me. Uh, he's going if he's gonna have to actually have access to a firearm that he can defend himself with, he's gonna be wearing it, or when he's at home, have it very close at hand. So essentially, he's got exposure to that deadly weapon twenty four hours a day, seven days a week, where he's on the range a few hours out of the year. So you don't need range rules. You need rules that apply to being around guns. Uh, you're going to be around guns somewhere else a hell of a lot more than you're going to be on range. So you don't need range rules. You need somewhere else rules. You need rules that cover you when you're around or handling a firearm, whether you're on range or somewhere else. The biggest problem is when you designate range rules, people think that that's the only place rules apply. I'm talking about it at a subconscious level more than at a conscious level that that's the only place rules apply, and then they do really, really stupid stuff with the gun somewhere else to create real problems. What we have to understand is that the requirements of handling the gun don't change whether you're on the pistol range, you're in the Walmart parking lot, you're in your bedroom. It doesn't matter where you are. It's still a deadly weapon. It still has to be handled exactly the same way. So what I really like people to understand is you don't need range rules. If you have rules that apply everywhere, they apply when you're at the range. So you don't need a separate set for the range. But you need rules that apply everywhere you are. If you have to handle that gun in the real world, away from the range, you're not going to have a backstop, you're not going to have burns, you're not going to have safety officers. So you have to deeply ingrain handling the gun correctly so that if you're not on the range and you have to handle that gun, we don't have some tragedy because you're not accustomed to being responsible for yourself away from the range. You know, it's, it's unfortunate. It's really hard to beat this into a lot of people. The only way you're going to have that gun when you need it in a sudden unforeseen crisis is to wear it on a routine daily basis. If you wear a gun on a routine daily basis, you're around a potential hazard an awful lot. So if you don't deeply habituate doing things correctly with it, that's where problems come from. So nobody's on the range enough to uh, really deeply ingrain those rules. So we have to get into the mind very early on that we're not talking about range procedures. We're talking about handling a gun period, no matter where you are, no matter what you're doing, no matter what circumstances are, no matter what somebody else did or didn't do, none of that matters. It's still a gun. You still handle it the same way. If we can deeply ingrain those rules, then we don't have problems away from the range, which is where people are 99.9% of the time. Well, and you do an excellent job of, of ingraining those rules. And, and, and if, if any of the students, and I doubt that they did, came to the class not knowing those rules, they they can um, certainly recite them verbatim um, by the end of the course. Hitting on a couple of the first day classroom and kind of edging on some of the stuff that stuck out to me, you know, you, you start with, you know, of course, the normal safety, which we just discussed. You talk about handgun nomenclature and operation, which... I have to admit that's something that I think a lot of new instructors overlook is mm -hmm. nomenclature and operation of of different of different firearms. You know, th that's I have to admit Brian is extremely good at all that. He's much better uh, over the nomenclature and operation of of a broad range of, of of other firearms, so that that I think is something really good that you you um, ingrain in us in that course. The um, the checklist of the responsibilities of instructors. I I really thought that that was an excellent part of of the classroom training, and one of those areas um, is having a medical plan and mm -hmm. assigning roles for the the. And that, excuse me, assigning the roles for the participants of that plan. Um, is that something that you feel is is overlooked a lot with newer instructors? Yeah, it is, unfortunately. Um, what, what you have to remember is that anytime you're dealing with firearms, we, we cannot remove that risk. We can mitigate that risk. We can manage it. We can minimize it, but we can't remove it. There's no such thing as safe work with firearms, particularly if you've got the least bit of relevancy in the training. If you're working from a holster and a speed and whatnot, uh, 
we can't remove risk. So we've always got to bear in mind the fact that you got 20, 25 people out there with loaded guns, somebody might get shot. But that's not the only thing we need to remember. Um, you know, <laughs> organizations train just over 50,000 students without getting one shot. But every year I wind up sending a couple of people to the hospital, uh, not for gunshot wounds, but for the myriad other things that happen in the course of physical activity. Um, in the summertime, heat injuries are not uncommon, particularly the people who spend the vast majority of their life in an air-conditioned cubicle. And then they, went and they find themselves for two or three days outside in the heat. Uh, not uncommon to have problems with that. A lot of people have underlying health issues they may even not be aware of that uh, can be exacerbated by that. Uh, we have other injuries. I've had people step in holes, turn ankles. Uh, had, had a guy trying to open a case of ammo with a big fixed blade knife and stuck it right through his hand, uh, literally in one side and out the other. Uh, those are the kind of things that require a medical plan as well. So even if you run the line in such a manner as, as we try to, that is very difficult to shoot themselves. Uh, there are all sorts of other bad things that can happen. Uh, I've always been a strict adherent to the premise that if you prepare well for trouble, you won't have any. Uh, the things that turn into emergencies are emergencies because you don't have a plan to deal with them. So if you've already got uh, designated people to uh, render immediate aid, you got designated people to go down to the gate, bring first responders to the part of the range you actually own so they don't have to hunt you down, uh, designate somebody to actually communicate with uh, law enforcement or whoever, not whoever, 911 or whoever, in, depending on what area you're in. Uh, that, that's why we, for instance, uh, we, we always take some of the law enforcement guys in class and make them responsible for the commo because they're accustomed to talking to dispatchers and dispatchers are accustomed to talking to them. So they know what to say, what not to say, how to say it to get a uh, appropriate response. Uh, we got people with medical training, whether they're doctors, EMTs, paramedics, combat lifesaver, put them in charge of rendering first aid. I have somebody familiar with the, prop the property go down to the gate and guide uh, responders in, that sort of thing. So if you think of all those things in advance, then you're far less likely to have to use them. Well, and, and frankly, um, Tom, when we do our courses, especially our fundamentals course, which is, is intended um, to be for newer shooters. Now, more advanced shooters will get something out of a, of course, but every now and then, and Brian can attest to this, we'll have a, a, a newer shooter when we start going through the medical briefing. You can see in their eyes, they're like, oh, boy. What am I getting myself into? <laughs> and but yeah. but then towards the end, you can tell that they appreciate um, our attention to detail on that. You know, mm -hmm. and it's like I said, it's important to have a plan. If if you don't have a plan, then you got to try to figure this stuff out while somebody's lying on the ground bleeding, and that is that is not the time to start designating people and and uh, figuring out how to get get help. So it's it's important to do that up front. You're talking about taking five minutes that we will probably not have to make use of during the class. But it's kind of like carrying your gun. If, if you do need it, you're going to need it pretty bad. Absolutely. And, and to hit on a highlight, you know, I kind of just breezed over some of the subject. I want the, want the audience to understand there's so much more breadth in this course that, that we can't just really hit on in the, in the course of an interview. But one of the things that I want to really point out um, for those that are, are interested in your course, I would say almost worth the price of the tuition alone is your, is your manual, student manual. Mm -hmm. I, I, I would think that if a person takes, takes your course, let's say they even, let's say, for instance, they don't even pass a course. And, and then there, it's not a super high washout rate, but there is a, is a, That's a about, about 15%. And so if a person was to take the course and then use the manual that you provide and as a personal regiment, man, what kind of shooter they could become mm -hmm. after studying and implementing the drills that you have in, in, in the manual and the education pieces. So that, that's outstanding. That, that's probably been a development for many, many years, has it not? Yeah. All, all of our courses have um, – a workbook or a manual or some sort of handout material and how big and involved it is depends on what kind of class it is, whether it's user level class or instructor level class. And uh, just like all the rest of the curriculum, that manual has evolved and grown over the years as we learn more stuff and refine a lot of uh, information, particularly about how we learn. 
and uh, which determines how we teach. So it's, it's right at 200 pages and just, as you said, just absolutely full of information. And uh, we, we go back and change it. In fact, I'm in the process of looking uh, uh, for next year, uh, see if we need to make any changes or updates to the, the one you have uh, for the 2021 training season, see if we need to change anything before we have a batch of those printed. And uh, it's, uh, as you said, a, a really valuable resource. Somebody that, that successfully completes the class can go back and look at parts of that manual over the next several weeks and, and a lot of the stuff that we have to hit kind of lightly in class because of time constraints. Uh, you can flesh out a good bit with that manual later. And uh, all, you're always going to have questions from students and, and the answers pretty much are going to be in that manual. Well, and, and frankly, I have been debriefing on my own and continuing to, to read from that manual. And like, it's been a, it's been maybe a week or two since I've had it open. But as we were on the road, a couple of times I opened them, I was like, man, this is just incredible information. And yeah, I just wanted to, to bring that out as one of the most positive aspects of the class. But uh, Aaron, what you got, buddy? Sure. Tom, now... We spoke about this a bit on the last episode, but we just want to hit on this again because it is so important and you enumerate it so well. And Eric again brought it up that that you spoke so well about it again in the course that we're debriefing here, but it's the topic of why we carry. So again, (coughs) could you hit on the importance of people understanding the real statistics on violent crime? (coughs) Yeah, you know, I, I don't want to get into a whole lot of individual statistics here, but the, the bottom line is, well, first let me say this. If, if you say someone is ignorant, that's that's not an insult. That's a statement of fact, okay? I'm ignorant about a lot of things. I'm ignorant about plasma welding. I don't know a thing about it, okay? And uh, ignorance simply means that you don't have information about a specific topic. An awful lot of people are ignorant about violent crime, but a lot of them are what I call willfully ignorant, which means they not only don't know, they by God don't want to know. Because if you know, then you have to think about it. If you think about it, you might be tempted to do something. So a lot of people make a real effort not to know what the actual level of violent crime is. There's a lot more violent crime in this country than the media, the government would would have you believe. Uh, The media, for instance, goes by the uh, FBI, UCR, the Uniform Crime Report. It's put out once a year for the uh, preceding year's stats. If you go to the UCR and actually read it, not just just look at the summary, it, uh, one of the questions the FBI answers for themselves is, what percentage of police departments report their data to them? That's 51%, half. So when you look at the, the crimes in the UCR, you have to remember you're looking at less than half of the actual crime. Why less? But because a number of those half of the departments that don't report are the ones with the most crime. Uh, they don't report because it makes their cities look bad. So uh, when, when the FBI, for instance, the UCR says there were 13,000 murders last year, no, it's actually about 40,000, uh, huge, huge disparity. But you have to know how to find that information uh, to, to be able to make an accurate assessment of that. But you know, one of the things I, we touch on in class, if you look at the murder rate in a metropolitan area, that really doesn't tell you anything about the violence rate in that metropolitan area, because uh, in the United States particularly, Trauma care now is an absolute miracle compared to what it was just, say, 50 years ago. Uh, people who would routinely die from injuries 50 years ago walk out of the hospital in a few days now. I'll give you an example. Uh, I moved out of the Memphis metro area in 2014, so I don't bother to check it anymore, but uh, 2013 was last year I bothered to check. There are 20 hospitals in the metropolitan area. One of them is a class one trauma center, so it gets most of the gunshot wounds. It doesn't get all of them, it gets most of them. Get a few hundred are scattered through the other 19 hospitals. That one hospital in 2013 treated 3,100 people for gunshots, 3,100 people for gunshots. That's an average of about nine a day. Less than 100 of them that were presented at the hospital alive died from those injuries, less than 100. Uh, whether it's a traffic accident, falling off a bridge, or being shot, the medical center there loses less than 1% of people presented with vital signs, which means if you roll in the door with a pulse, you're going to come back out alive. So consequently, when you look at the murder rate, you really didn't tell you a damn thing because those are the rare exceptions. Those are the people shot eight or nine times and left somewhere out of the way until it's too late to do anything for them. The, uh, 
aggravated assault rate is what gives you a better idea of, of the actual violence rate. It, it, aggravated assault essentially means somebody tried to kill you, but because of medical intervention, you didn't die. Uh, in Memphis, in that same year, there were 9,165 of those. There were only 154 actual homicides where somebody died and stayed dead. But there were over 9,000 attempts. And again, because of trauma care, the vast majority of those people aren't going to die. It doesn't mean they got off scot-free. It just means they didn't die. In the U.S. as a whole, there are well over a million aggravated assaults a year. Uh, that's one out of 300 people. So uh, this is not some, you know, I laugh when people say, the odds of my needing a gun are one in a, in a million. No, that one out of 300 is going to be the victim of just an aggravated assault alone, not to mention armed robbery, rape, et cetera, et cetera. So, According to the Justice Department, your lifetime odds of being involved in violent crime are about one in four. Uh, one in four is a hell of a long way from one in a million. But most people don't know that because they, they go out of their way not to. So one of the things we have to spend a few minutes on uh, in class is to go over the actual uh, level of crime, the actual statistics about the different types of crime, aggravated assault, murder, forcible rape, armed robbery so that you can turn around and impart that to your students to have them understand why it is, in fact, important to carry a gun on a daily basis. You don't get to pick the day you're going to need the gun. Somebody else is going to present you with that problem. If you didn't bring the equipment with you, you don't get to use it. And so if you intend to protect yourself against one of those violent crimes, you have to actually have your gun with you. So the hardest single thing to get across to new students is that necessity to actually wear the gun, not to take it on, put it in a side drawer and think, you know, I've got my magic charm now, nothing bad will happen to me. 999 people out of 1,000 that buy a pistol think of it as a rabbit's foot. <laughs> but uh, if you think about it, rabbit had four of them. Somebody caught him, skinned him alive, ate his flesh, and sold his feet as souvenirs. So maybe that's not the best plan. <laughs> well, well, Tom, I I just want to highlight something that, that you highlight. But again, I think it's still so hard to get across to so many people, whether they are in our community trying to learn how to protect themselves or, of course, the people that are not keyed into it, the, the thing that sticks out to me most is the concept of the, the risk over a person's lifetime. They, mm. they really do think of only today. It's a real low chance that I'm going to get mm. harmed or, um, or attacked today. But that doesn't matter. <laughs> it's your whole lifetime. You're protecting your life. You're protecting your family's lives. It's your lifetime that you're considered um, that you're concerned about. Yeah. So it's just amazing to me how hard that is to get across to people. They they don't even they don't even allow themselves to think yeah. past a single day. Yeah. The problem is if if you only need that gun once in ten thousand days, you don't know which one of those days it is. It might be the first one, it might be the last one, it might be anyone in between there. So the only way to have the gun on all of those is to carry it in all 10,000 days. It's just that simple. Oh, nobody's going to call you at 7 in the morning and say, bring your gun today at around 6 this evening on the parking lot and we'll try to kill you. Uh, the fact that we prefer, prefer you didn't bring one. So they're not going to tell you in advance. And, you know, it can carry a gun every, every day, day and day, I'd be a pain in the butt. Yeah, it can. I know I've been doing that for over 50 years. Uh, can be caught without it being an even bigger pain in the ass. Uh, yeah, sure can. Uh, and, you know, people tend to only think of themselves. People tend to be very self-centered. If, uh, if you're murdered or you're crippled, can't, can't work, can't support your family, who does that affect? It doesn't just affect you. It affects your spouse, it affects your children, it affects your coworkers, it affects employees if you're a business owner. Um, you have a duty to take care of yourself, and part of that's being armed and capable. Couldn't agree more. That is awesome material, man. I've got a question about um, going back to 96 or even further back. If there's one thing that you could strike out that's like stands out, what, what's the biggest paradigm shift of what you think it's important for people to learn from your course that you maybe didn't teach or people didn't feel was important back when you started? Hmm. I'd have to think about that one for a while, but really, I'll be honest with you, um, I do a four-hour lecture uh, in a separate class, not the one we're talking about, but on the history of firearms training from 1920 to 2020, uh, what we think of today as organized 
firearms training really didn't start until about 1920. And uh, over that hundred years, it evolved a bit. But one of the things you're struck by if you if you really study it and look at that hundred years is it's not a hundred years of linear progress. It's the same cycle over and over again every 15 or 20 years, about, about five times now. Um, none of this stuff is new. Uh, a lot of this stuff was well known many years ago. Um, in the 1920s and 1930s, the U.S. went through a very violent period, uh, not just because of prohibition. That had a, a big impl- influence on it. But also the first narcotics laws, the Great Depression, um, the Dust Bowl, uh, the beginning of the migration from the rural areas to, to urban, and the advent of the affordable automobile. All of a sudden, American society became mobile. And when you put all those things together, there was a cut off a lot of violence in the 1920s, 1930s, and a lot of people who were involved uh, in uh, law enforcement in a lot of shootings, because in those days, uh, the uh, legal and political atmosphere was radically different than it is today. Somebody shot at a cop who was pretty much assumed he was going to get shot back. And uh, there were guys in the 20s and 30s, uh, some of which are known today and some not because they didn't get attached to a publicist. But the information is there if you know how to dig for it. And uh, they knew a good deal about gunfighting at that point. And uh, like I said, really, we're not discovering anything new today. We're, we're just recycling the same stuff over and over again. So to be honest with you, technique has changed a little bit. Equipment has changed a lot. We've got a lot of stuff now we didn't have 40 years ago. Now, 40 years ago, if you had a semi-automatic pistol, you had a 1911, unless you were the one guy, a thousand, that had Browning high power. But uh, look at the uh, variety handguns we have today. So uh, one thing that's changed for instructors is having to know how to run a variety of guns. Um, Eric mentioned in the very early on in this about going over the nomenclature and operation of a number of different kinds of guns. If guys that work in a law enforcement academy setting typically only have one kind of gun to keep up with. But in the private sector, think of all the things somebody can show up to class with. So an instructor's got to be capable of running a Traditional double action gun, a traditional single action, striker fired, a revolver, all of the different uh, autos. So uh, that's one big change. We, we've got to know how to work properly, handle a number of different types of firearms now. Uh, other equipment has changed, you know, but uh, like appendix here, it's nothing new about that. I picture on my desk here of a Southwestern Lawman in 1925 with a, a custom made AIWB rig on with a peacemaker in it. So, nice. uh, yeah, I saw uh, that. No, no, this stuff is new. It's all uh, goes around. Oh, good. I'm glad I asked the question because that's uh, that also makes me intrigued about that lecture. So, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, and frankly, um, that is one of the most awesome parts about the course with Tom um, is his alignment of history and 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 also. And Tom, I'll kind of bring up one of the later portions of the class that was just fun. And again, your um, your interleaving of history, um, where you had us shoot that one drill on the um, on the card. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you know that that actually um, was a oh with qualification. Yeah, yeah. It just um, the five shots in five seconds on a on a um, playing card. And, and what did you say? You said that if you could do that, that it, back in, yeah. back in the day, you were a fair hand. Was that? Fair hand was with pistol. Yeah. yeah, that was, that was really cool. Speaking of live fire, day one, a live fire, you, you had us start off with fairly low pressure, mainly working from the ready position, um, checking out everybody's safe firearms handling and getting a baseline of the class. What are you typically looking for in the instructor development course on day one of live fire? Well, to recall, one of the primary things we're working on throughout that class is teaching you how to coach. Absolutely. And coaching is a lot more involved, a lot more complex, a lot more complicated than, than most people realize. That's why I see so few competent coaches. And uh, with the coaching, just like with everything else, we have to start small steps and work our way up. So on day one, really all we want the coaches looking for are safety issues, not technique issues. And so we have to teach you how to how to do that. 
Um, just like we teach rookies in law enforcement, one, one of the things we've got to beat into your head as a coach is you've got to learn to watch people's hands. Uh, they can't hurt themselves and they can't hurt anybody else without involving their hands. And their hands operate a handgun uh, 100%. Big. So we, we have to look for a lot of things, proper grip, proper trigger finger placement, trigger finger discipline, uh, the, all sorts of little things that, that you have to be looking at for hands to see. So on day one, we're just uh, trying to trying to program the coaches to actually look at the hands and see, uh, and again, particularly safety issues on day one, and get that squared away. Uh, as I guess one thing we could mention now, because we hadn't yet, uh, when we're on the range, which is about half the class in the instructor class, uh, if you're not shooting, you're coaching. And when that drill is done, we, sh- we change places, and the coach that becomes a shooter and the shooter becomes a coach. So you're either shooting or coaching the entire time we're on the range. You're never just standing on the range. So what we're trying to do on day one is just get you accustomed to the idea of actually watching your student, not watching the birds fly by, and not watching the holes appear in the target. Uh, I see so many coaches all the time standing there staring at a target while the guy shoots. Uh, the bullet holes in the target are going to heal. They're going to be there a minute from now. But you've only got a fleeting opportunity to see what your student's actually doing. So uh, day one is primarily to teach you to watch a student and primarily to watch his hands. And uh, again, looking for the, uh, trigger finger discipline, muzzle discipline, so that by the end of the first day, we know we can kind of turn you loose, you might say, on the second day. That's why we don't really do the detailed coaching lecture until the morning the second day and give you your coaching checklist so that on the second day, you can actually start working on technique. But you had to get used to the idea of watching the hands on, on the first day. Because just like with new shooters, new coaches have to learn one thing at a time, step by step in the building block approach, just like we teach the shooters, uh, or they're not going to be uh, able to become coaches in three days. Well, and Tom, I, I, I'm so glad that you brought that up because I was going to bring that up here in just a second. But obviously, you can describe it much better for the audience, speaking from a student's a student's standpoint, that was probably the best learning experience of the whole course was that Tom had us, every single drill that I did, my counterpart did, and I coached, and I, or they coached, and uh, with, with the methods that Tom taught us during the progre- progression we got to implement right there on the line. It, it was an incredible learning experience for sure. Yeah, that's the only way you can learn to coach is by coaching. And uh, just like when you learn to shoot under supervision, you learn to coach under supervision. And we try to correct the coach. And uh, then the coach corrects the shooter. And then everybody's learning at the same time. I, I detest wasted time in class. Uh, you may have noticed that. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> so what we try to do is wring everything we can out of every minute. So if you're either shooting or coaching every minute, you're on the range and we're actually getting something out of that time. Yeah. And, and just like, uh, as we were shooting one of the, um, and this is something that Brian's always been in tune with is doing the, what in the competition realm would be seen as a speed reload. You definitely in that course had me rethinking my philosophy on um, that speed reload, which is really what civilian is likely going to do if they even get to a reload. But but just to make the point is that yeah we were we were never wasting time um, mm-hmm. at all, and and if anybody was, you were on their rear end over it, and and a regarding ammunition. I mean, you always told us, okay, you got a chance to go ahead and reload and make sure you put a, a, a good handful of ammunition in your pocket. So anytime we were slightly in idly, idle and or we were coaching, you know, mm-hmm. um, you're also during those periods of time trying to top off your magazine. So that was a brilliant way to handle that piece. Yeah, well, now I'm explaining the next drill, that sort of thing, you can be stuffing magazines. There's no reason to stand there. Yeah. So if you got around... If you got rounds on your person, you can always have your magazines topped up and you don't waste a lot of time. You know, the the problem is because the three out of four of the students are there on their own time and their own dime, uh, about a fourth of the students are there at their agencies because the agency's paying their tuition and paying them to be there and whatnot, but three-fourths are there out of their own pocket. And because of that, the, the guys that are there out of their own pocket typically can't take five days for a class and a couple of days on either end for travel and whatnot. It's just not possible. 
So what we typically do is is pack four or five days of training into those three days. Uh, so uh, as you notice, we're never just standing around. If we're not in the classroom actually working on something, you're out on the range actually working on something. And uh, that means you got you got to come prepared to work. You got to have uh, rounds in your pocket, stuff your magazines, and be ready to get on to the next thing because we got a lot to cover in three days. Yeah, Tom, you didn't suffer very didn't suffer very well if folks came to the line without ammo. <laughs> Yeah, what, 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 what do you come to the fire line for? <laughs> come to shoot? Eric, uh, Eric. shoot, maybe I'll break some ammo. Eric, did you ever hear Tom say, man, that's a strange effing habit? N- no, but I remember you telling me that story when you took uh, the establishing um, dominance paradigm. <laughs> Again, I'll never forget people, that. People, people that shoot on their own typically pick up a lot of kind of sloppy range habits. Uh, what we're trying to avoid in the class is just like we talked about earlier, is not having range procedures, but having procedures you follow with a gun. And, uh, you know, if you have fired your gun several rounds and before you put it away, what would be a smart thing to do? Load it back up. And so we start getting in those habits. Uh, whatever you do on the range repetitively is what you tend to do out in the world. So we just want to try to get away from those sloppy range habits and, and build habits that would do us some good. Well, Tom, um, before I I start mentioning some of what we did on day two live fire, I also wanted to comment, and I I pulled you to the side. I felt that it was important for me to mention, you know, I've spent a lot of my last few years focusing on training uh, under Craig Douglas, and and especially his ECQC course. Mm -hmm. And and one of the things that, that was always nice about the way Craig uh, develops his coursework and or the way that he builds upon the coursework itself is that that's a tough course. And, you know, you're nervous, you know, you're feeling, you know, sometimes you might feel, um, you know, just trepidation, but Craig is really good about building your confidence throughout the coursework. Mm -hmm. And, And you did the identical same thing, with this instructor development, because I, I I think I alluded to it earlier pre-show, is that I knew I'd be okay in the class. I felt I w- was prepared, but I was still very nervous. And mm-hmm. um, but you did an excellent job about building blocks that gave us confidence in the next higher complexity in the course. And and yeah. I, I appreciated that greatly. Thank you. Yeah, you have you have to use. Uh, a logical progression. You have to learn how to do this, so then we can teach you how to do this, so then we can add this. Uh, Craig and I teach together several times a year. He handles a zero to two meter problem, and I handle a two to 25 meter problem. It, it makes us together really well. But uh, one of the reasons I do that with him is I, I recognized 15, 16, 17 years ago when I first hosted him that he actually knew how to teach. Not just knew his material, and not just knew how to do it, but knew how to teach it. And no, that's something you don't run into that much. The excellence in pedagogy, um, as as uh, we would say, hey. Hmm. So, I agree. so as far as day two, um, day two was when, and, and I may have some of this this a little slightly um, mixed up because it was. I mean, we did move, 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 but day yeah, two. Day two, we started um, doing a lot of work from the holster and and increasing the complexity throughout the day. But also, one of the things that uh, stuck out to me was throughout the end of the day, you started taking us through peer to peer competition on on a couple of different drills. Mm-hmm. Can, can you talk about um, number one the importance of competition in class at any level, if it even be beginner or you know kind of fundamentals up through instructor courses? Can you talk about the importance of competition in class and why you actually use it as a tool? Yeah, you know, with beginning students, you don't want to do that. Uh, they're already stressed uh, pretty much to the max. If you think about it, you know, we're getting a lot of people now buying guns that never had one before, and the products of the uh, modern educational system have been told that guns are sentient beings that will jump off the table and shoot them if you don't watch them very closely. So they're, they're really 
stressed about having to handle a live firearm with real ammo. They're stressed about being at the range among people that don't know handling real guns with live ammo. They're stressed about you because you're a threatening figure to them from a, a ego standpoint as much as a physical standpoint. So your, your beginning students you got plenty of stress. Uh, we, we have to kind of nurture them and, and bring them along a little bit. But we reach a point where we have to start learning how to operate under stress. If uh, you want to look in the dictionary under stress, it says some asshole of Carl Lincoln is trying to shoot you. <laughs> and we have to get used to operating. Now, what's the only way you're going to get used to operating under stress? you got to operate under stress. So there are a number of ways we can stress you a little bit, raise your anxiety level. We do a lot of, uh, you know, when we first, the first time we brought the stopwatch out, what happened to your anxiety level? Went up. Okay. Definitely. First time we tell you you're going to score the next drill and announce your score, whatever your anxiety level goes up. But we reach a point where, where you've become acclimated to those things a bit after a while, so we jack it up a little more. And the easiest way to jack your anxiety level up is to expose you to a little peer pressure. Um, you know, if you have any perform in front of the other people in the class, um, there goes your anxiety level really high. And if you're having to do something against another live thinking, breathing opponent, then we're getting pretty close to what, what you're going to find out in the field. And so we, just like with the skill, other skills, the physical skills, we start out really low and then we work it up a little bit, work it up a little bit. Instead, we, when we went from just an open-ended time limit to having the stopwatch or the timer, everybody's anxiety level goes up greatly. But then you get used to that after a little while and you kind of plateau. So then we, start actually scoring and recording some scores. I think your anxiety level goes up. And if you get used to that, then you start to plateau. Then we put you in a little competition and it brings you up again. And then you get used to that and you kind of plateau. So the idea is that you get out in the world, have to use that gun for real under real stress. It's not the first time you ever had to use a gun under stress. Yeah, that was a, that's a superb um, description, Tom. I, I think that's great. Now, we're going to hit back on some of the the live fire, but I want to really take an opportunity to talk about some more classroom discussion. Your your legal instruction during the course, um, a subject that can be so complex and yet be one of the number one things that will will get people in trouble and and oh, yeah. and thrown in jail. You do a very good job of of, of kind of uh, condensing that information to some some very basic tenets that you can that that if you remember and adhere by, it'll keep you out of trouble. Can you kind of hit on? I know that's a big question, but it is. Talk about that. Yeah, you know, actually, you, when you carry a gun, you've got basically three priorities you want to keep in mind. You want to stay alive. You want to stay out of jail, and you want to stay out of the poorhouse. Uh, and they go in that order. Uh, we can fix being in the poorhouse. We can fix being in jail. We can't be shit about being dead. So we, we got to really focus on that. And uh, this is <laughs> this is one of those topics that is incredibly simple, just dirt simple, and yet it's somewhat complex. Uh, there's a lot of nuance involved, and unfortunately, almost everybody now. Uh, has watched tens of thousands of hours of TVs and movies and, and whatnot uh, involving firearms. And they just have no idea what you actually uh, are legally entitled to do and what you're legally forbidden to do with a firearm. So uh, that's something I think it's a real mistake to turn people loose in the world, mechanically knowing how to operate a gun, but not knowing when and when to use it and when not to. Uh, as I say, if you win the gunfight and go to prison the rest of your life, you hadn't really won. You're just as big a loser as the guy that died. Uh, so we, we have to get into that. Um, as I said, it can be remarkably simple and, and terribly complex at the same time. Um, and, and it takes some understanding of that nuance to be able to explain it to people properly. Uh, you know, it's funny, in, uh, in law school, they covered deadly force law to a little bit less than the degree we covered in the instructor course. Uh, wow. Surprises a lot of people. But you'll you'll talk, talk to a trial lawyer, you'll find out that's, that's the truth. Um, I've actually had sitting judges uh, back uh, when we had our uh, fixed facility in Memphis. I had a policy of putting judges, prosecutors, and on-air TV personalities through permit class for free just to educate them and uh, get the other side to understand more of what we're doing and why we do it that way and whatnot. And I've actually had sitting judges tell me they 
learned uh, things they didn't, had no idea about in the deadly force lecture. And uh, the, the reason for that is quite simple. Not one attorney in 10,000 ever handles a justifiable shooting case. But what do most attorneys handle? They handle property, you know, corporate law, real estate law, divorce, child custody law, personal injury, automobile accident law. Not one lawyer in 10,000 will ever handle a justified shooting. And because of that, they don't waste time on that topic in law school. It's like a medical uh, specialty. If you want to know anything about it, you've got to go back and take separate courses on it later. <clears throat> Excuse me. So one of the things we have to do is is to demystify that and uh, put it in terms where the layman can, can understand, okay, this is what the law says I can do, and this is what the law says I better not do, and uh, have some understanding of uh, using that gun before you set out in public with it. You know, the court's position, I, I do a fair bit of expert witness work all over the country in both state and federal courts. And court's position is if you want to carry a gun in public, that's fine, but it's going to be incumbent on you to get proper training and then to follow the rules. And if not, there's some pretty darn serious penalties. Uh, you know, one of the things I point out on, on the very first morning is uh, if you look at any of the ancient mythologies, religions, whichever you want to call them, Egyptian, Greek, Roman, Assyrian, Norse, makes no difference whatsoever. Any corner of the world makes no difference whatsoever. One of the attributes of the gods was the ability to point their hands at people and smite them at a distance. And well, that's exactly what you can do with a pistol. Point your hand at somebody and smite them at a distance. So you, in essence, have the power of the ancient gods. And this is an idea that existed for thousands of years before handguns came along. Uh, handguns are just an outgrowth of that, that innate human desire. And if you'll think about it, when they give you that law enforcement commission card or that carry permit card, it makes no difference which, and you put that in your pocket, what they actually just handed you was the power of life and death over everybody you come in contact with from that point on. You get to pick people out right, on, right out there on the street and make them die on the spot. No appeal, no recourse, no way to fix it. If you're wrong, you're dead. They stay that way. Now, with that kind of power comes uh, something in return. And when I ask a typical class, what is that? Uh, I always get the word responsibility. And that's not the case at all, really. You need to think about that. The correct word is accountability. You can be 100% responsible for something and not be held accountable. You can be held accountable. So you have to know when you can use the gun, when you cannot, and have that very deeply internalized before you start wearing that gun in public. Or you may wind up winning your fight and uh, going to jail in the poorhouse. And to me, that's not a win. That's what my good friend Claude Werner would call a negative outcome. Absolutely. And one of the things that are actually two comments, my son, he's a, he's a new Marine and and you know, really cool aspect of us moving. You know, I, I think I mentioned that my wife and I were moving to North Carolina and our son, he's just two hours from us um, now. So, so we're going to be able to see him a lot more again. But one of the things that I'm, you know, so proud of him is that he heard me say this statement once regarding legalities um, and, and basically stand out of trouble Masada Yub said at one point, he said, once you carry a gun, you lose the right to flip somebody the bird. Oh, absolutely. And I think that, you know, if people think about little, you know, uh, mental cues like that, and or one of the things that um, you point out very well in, in your course and something Andrew Bronca talks about very thoroughly there's a majority of gun owners thinks that you can shoot people over property and you just mm -hmm. can not do that. And no, yeah, you, can't. No, you can, you'll go to prison, but you can. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Exactly. So that's something I really wanted to hit since, uh, you know, I want our audience, if they're not exposed to that, you can't shoot people over property and not, uh, not go to jail. So no. uh, a real common, a real common bad result. Somebody hears somebody out in the driveway, mess with their car or whatnot, and they go out and wind up firing a shot at them. Uh, that, that guy's committing a rather low-level crime that the odds are he wouldn't spend a day in jail for if he got caught by the police. He'd be out on probation so fast your head would spin. But you fire a shot at him, you're committing a serious felony for which you wind up going to prison. Uh, that's not what your gun's for. You know, you're going to have to learn to ignore somebody cutting cutting you off in traffic, somebody grabbing your, your quote-unquote parking spot. Um, 
flipping you off. Uh, none of those things uh, can have a response from you when you're wearing a gun. Uh, you, you have to become a lot more circumspect. You have to uh, be a lot more mature. You have to be willing to endure some of the little indignity that we all face from time to time because you're armed and you can be held to a higher standard as somebody that's not. Because again, like I said, you've got literally the power of life and death right there in your hands. You're going to be expected to be a, a bit more cautious, a little more sober, a little more sane, a little more uh, willing to put up with crap, basically. What's the saying? As soon as you put on a gun, every fight is a gunfight. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Every confrontation you get. I used to ask the rookie cops that when I teach them, I said, what percentage of the calls are you going to go and involve, to involve a gun? 100%. You brought it. Yep. <laughs> you brought one. Everybody's got one. Everybody's got access to one. Well, um, Tom, as far as uh, day three, day three is the big test day, wouldn't you say? Yeah, we, we do some other things. You know, we've got, uh, I think, four lectures on that day, but uh, got to do the uh, qualification shooting first thing, get that out of the way, and then uh, do the written test at one point during the day. And uh, as you know, those are pretty much to make it and break it. Yeah, and, and frankly, I, I was really glad that, I mean, you, you said a key in point. You said, okay, we're going to shoot the test tomorrow morning when you guys are all fresh. You had a, mm -hmm. a day of rest, and, um, and so we shoot the FBI um, 2019 qualification, and which, which is a, a decent course. I mean, it's not easy. But you, I like the thing that you emphasize. You're like, you know, don't go by the FBI standards. We want you, you know, shooting center mass on this, not just the the um, target itself. Mm -hmm. um, but then your range master qualification is a degree more difficult. But um, for yeah. the audience, you know, we're not going to talk about specifics on on your range master qualification. But the audience can look up the FBI qualification. And what I would say is just as to, and if you're okay with me saying this, if you can um, shoot a 90% on the FBI qual and shoot the bulk of your rounds in the 8-inch or 10-inch circle on the range master um, target, you're likely to be able to pass the range master qualification. But if you got all your, you know, your rounds outside of that, then you might have a little difficulty on your qual. Is that okay to say? Yeah. And if somebody, and as you said, the FBI qual is easily accessible on the internet. If you can shoot 90% on that scored their way, which is the easy way. If you can shoot 90% on that, when you come into the course, by the end of the course, you're not going to have any trouble passing either one of them because, as you, as you saw, everybody, even the upper-level shooters, skill comes up in the course of two days of being coached for every round you fire for uh, 600 rounds. And uh, so if you can shoot 90% on that when you come into the course, you're not going to have any trouble passing either one of them for real. Yeah, I'm glad you enunciated that. that I just wanted to give some folks in the audience that may be interested in the course, give them an idea of uh, what level of shooting they should come to the course with. Thank you for that. Yeah. Now, I would say on the written test, I'm not going to lie, I studied a lot for that. It, is that, I think I might have heard you say before that that might be one of the areas where you have um, a majority of the washouts is in the written test. Am I correct or incorrect on that? No, uh, I wouldn't say majority, but uh, maybe half and half. Oh, uh, two kinds of people don't pass this class. Uh, we've got historically, if you look at, at fifty of these classes, it's going to wash out to it's going to come out to about a fifteen percent washout rate. Uh, that does not mean every class has fifteen percent failure. Uh, some classes everybody passes. Some classes four, five, six people don't don't pass. That's not really predictable. But if you look at a large number of them, it will average out to about fifteen percent. And that 15% always falls into one of two categories. Either they come into an instructor class unprepared to carry a gun, much less teach somebody else how to carry a gun. Uh, they have no real background, no real skill, very little prior training. And, and frankly, I, I have to just ask myself, what the, what the hell are you doing in an instructor course? I mean, I've, I've never scuba dived, so it would never occur to me to walk into a scuba shop and say, I've never divin, but I'd like to be a dive instructor. Can you <laughs> sign me up? Um, it wouldn't occur to me. But an awful lot of people show up for 
an instructor class to teach people how to fight for their lives with a handgun who don't know how to operate a handgun, uh, which kind of baffles me. So at, uh, a good number of the people that, that fail have a really weak background. They typically have got a lot of really bad habits. Uh, they're typically very reluctant to change them. You know, if, if I go over to a guy and say, uh, you know, you need to do this or that, and they say, but this is the way I've always done it. Uh, yeah, but you're not shooting well enough that way. But this is the way I've always done it. But you're not going to pass if you do it that way. But this is the way I've always done it. Okay, fine. And then that person doesn't pass. Uh, the others are people who kind of think, well, hell, I already know all this stuff, and they don't study the manual. Uh, what I tell you on the first morning? Uh, there are 80 questions on a written test, and where's the answer to every single one of them? In the manual. The manual. So if you don't crack the manual, and I've, and I've run into this. I've had students who actually never opened the manual Friday night or Saturday night or the first two nights of the class. And then they open up their written test on Sunday and go, Jesus, there's a lot of stuff in here. And they wind up not passing the written test because they didn't study for it. The information is right there in the book. We, of course, it's all in the course of the lectures, we go over everything that's in the test. But it's also right there in the book. If you hear it in class and you see it on the screen and you go back to your room and you read it in the book, then you will probably retain it for the test on TV3. But if all you've done is listen in the classroom and you don't study at all, then don't be surprised you don't do well on the written test. And it's an instructor class, so the depth of your knowledge is an important aspect of that. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's not an open book test because it's not a test of how well you can look up crap. It's what do you actually know about this field? And uh, I'm pretty cut and dried about that. You either pass or you don't. Uh, I have people every now and then, you know, 90% is the cutoff for the written test and both the qualification courses. And I have people making the mid-80s come to me and say, you know, well, I almost passed. And I said, well, I almost gave you a certificate. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> well, well, you know, I would, I'll say, it, I remember you um, talking about um, and I and I'm I'm a little bit funny that way. I'm I'm always doing that in any course I'm in anyway because you know I don't test as well as others, so I typically have to study more than 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 sure, others. Some people be better at written tests than others. That's just a fact of life. Yeah, and so I I have to tell you, um, I remember you saying that you guys don't leave your book on the on the. I mean, I wasn't going to do that in the first place, but what's funny is. I know I put my book in my backpack and I will tell you that in the scrambling inside my room, I'm like, where in the heck is my, it was in my backpack, but I had, I'd shuffled some stuff around. I was freaking out for a minute. I was like, Oh no, I'm going to lose the night for study. And I was like, Oh shit. So, um, yeah, that, that was definitely something, you, you know, audience members, you definitely still have to study. And you have to put in some hours. I put in some hours on that, on studying for that test. So be mindful of that. So, well, you know, like I said a little while ago, and, and I really wasn't being funny, it's not intended to be easy. Uh, this is a, a prestigious certification based on the fact that you got to actually work for it. It's not a gimme. It's not, you know, you didn't qualify because your check cleared. You've got to be able to shoot to a certain standard. You've got to establish that you have a knowledge base to a certain standard. And if you do that, then you join the ranks of people that are certified. And if not, you don't. And, you know, certifications are meaningless if they don't have standards and the standards aren't enforced. Well, and Tom, I will tell you that, number one, I feel humbled to, to have, have passed. And, and frankly, I'm very proud to, to have that certification. Um, so, so thank you very much for that high standard. Now, frankly, it just proves to me how much more I really have to work on, get into mm -hmm. the next um, advanced course. And, the, you know, I plan on, you know, going to the other courses, obviously. That's, mm -hmm. that, that's well, like, like I told you in class, this is not a, a destination. When I, when I sign your certificate for that first level instructor class, it doesn't magically make you competent. It's a step on the journey. Absolutely. Um, you know, I've been teaching for 45 years. And I still try to take at least two classes a year outside my own organization to keep current, get some trigger time, see what's developing in, in the industry and whatnot. Um, people ask me all the time, say, as long as you've been doing this, why do you still take classes? It's because I'm not done yet. Oh, well, and Tom, that is, that's our standard as well. I mean, we, we 
because we um, train under folks like you and 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 the folks that we respect, that's our mantra too. And we're and we're 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 beginner instructors when it really comes down to it. But you know, we've been training in in the combatives and 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 shooting arts for many years. We will never not be students in in Evo Sec for sure. Yeah, it's it's a continual learning process if you're doing it right oh uh, it's 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 a it's a journey not a destination well tom aaron here i i think this kind of brings up a good it's a good point to bring up this question now i have to premise this by saying this is the second time listening to you on a show you made me buy a gun <laughs> <laughs> but but this is actually regarding what's that I hope you can find one <laughs> I actually did amazing enough in this that's a topic for another day but I was blown away a, a buddy yeah. found this one for me but r- real quick so the reason why I went ahead and got a new gun is because you spoke about being an instructor these days and back to what you were just saying a little bit ago, um, needing to t- keep current in your own education, you mentioned on the last show that you really need to be able to run red dots these days or you're going to get left behind. So so mm-hmm. I um, after that, I started looking for one of those new Glock MOSs that, that comes with the slide ready to accept an optic. I, I, I found mm-hmm. that one, and I'm just going to grab my optic here pretty soon, but... Could you touch on the reason why you delineated that, um, that that new instructors or instructors need to keep up with those? Well, how can you teach somebody how to operate something if you don't know how yourself? Uh, I've made an effort to, to learn as much as I can about uh, optics and uh, how, to, how to teach somebody how to use them because you're going to have a certain percentage uh, show up in class. I think in... Uh, the class we just did in uh, Arizona, I think about a third of the class had dots, if my memory serves correctly. Um, pretty pretty confident of that, about a third. And that's a big enough percentage that you, you have to know how to run one. Um, you have to be able to give people advice. If they're screwing something up, you need to be able to diagnose that and tell them how to fix it. And uh, so I think that's fairly important. Uh, you know, my wife, who also teaches, you know, just had her second uh, object gun set up. Cost me a bloody fortune. <laughs> but... Uh, She's making a real effort right now to, to learn how to, to run a dot gun well. And uh, that, that's something that just goes with the territory if you're going to teach. Uh, you know, if uh, some of you run into an institutional training setting, you know, you got a guy that works for an agency that issues Glocks, he knows how to run a Glock, but doesn't know how to run a traditional double action gun or a single action auto with safety like a 1911 or a revolver. So, how can he teach people how to use those other guns if he doesn't know how to do it himself? So you, you have to at least be conversant with uh, all the different types and um, at least be able to demonstrate to a, a reasonable skill level with all the different types. And, and today that would include with a dot. Well, and it's it's not as intuitive as a lot of people think, right? Yeah, it's radically different than irons. Uh, it, it's, you know, we beat into your head over and over again, look at the front sight, and then we give you a dot, say, don't look at the dot, look at the target. And uh, it's, it's, it's a big adjustment for a lot of people. Yeah, but again, your talk on it really did encourage me to go ahead and set that up due to our business and in instruction. So um, I'm looking forward to getting that running. But I've ran one a few times, but yeah, it it, it jumps around there. Actually, the first time I ran one was at um, one of Spencer Keeper's classes. I was like, man, I'm gonna have a, I'm gonna have a hard time. <laughs> I'm gonna have a hard time running this thing. I need to get one and learn how. Yeah. Yeah, it may not be the best thing to jump into the deep end like that with something new. Uh, it's uh, that's pretty high speed class to try to learn how to use a new piece. Of oh no, I tried one out. Oh no, I I didn't I didn't run it the whole time. But no, it, it was a surprise to me for sure. Yeah, it's definitely a different technique. Well, Tom, I think we're getting close to the end of the show, and and I, I definitely. I want to let you get back to your evening. I know it's close to Christmas. We really, really appreciate um, you coming on just a couple of days before Christmas. Yeah, Tom, I just wanted to take a second to mention some of the top shooters. Um, A very special dude to me, um, Chris LaPrey. 
Mm-hmm. Awesome, awesome. I hadn't seen him in 10 years. I met him the first DCQC that, uh, again, um, Cecil Birch was the host of this course. Well, he hosted ECQC mm-hmm. back in 2010, my first time, and Chris was there. And it was excellent to um, to train and shoot with him. He's such a good dude. And, man, he, he kicked ass. He he was the top bull, bullseye. He did the top on the bull yeah. um, drill, didn't yeah, he? Yeah. He got the coin for the bullseye course. Yeah, yeah, he did awesome. And yeah, he's, he's a very, very squared away dude. Uh, the the uh, sheriff's officer is really lucky to have him. Yeah, he's he's an he's a really uh, great guy, and and I look forward to training with him more. Um, we've been talking about having him on the show, so hopefully in the next week or so we'll have him on. And then of course Tim Heron. Man, he was he was one of my um, partners, so I got the opportunity for him to be one of my coaches mm-hmm. as well. So he he did awesome, and very very high level shooter. And then top, uh, the top gun was Eric Gelhouse, and he was also one of my coaches. Uh, he's from Gunsight, and and he was the top gun. And that that was a that was a, a very tight knit of shooters, was it not? Mm-hmm. It was at uh, the uh, top five, six shooters were uh, aggregate scores were only separated by a piece of a point, piece of a second. And, and so, I, I would, I feel bad because there's a couple of the gentlemen that I, I just didn't get as much interaction with, so I may be forgetting their name. But uh, yeah, just, just while we're on the topic, uh, one of the things we do as you're learning to coach, as you just kind of mentioned in passing, is we change partners frequently so that you get to coach different people and see different errors that different people make. And then also different people get to watch you. And the guy that was just coaching, you may have missed something that the next guy coaching you catches. So that's one of the reasons we do that. So that's how you got to work with Eric and Tim and, and other people during the course of the weekends. We change those partners every couple of hours. Yeah, that um, it's really cool how um, the discussion brings that out, Tom. I'm, I'm really glad you brought that up. Yeah, superb course, Tom. I, I'm so excited, um, number one, to be a part of it. I'm glad it's over, like I said before. <laughs> but, but I look forward to the next one. And frankly, we're really glad you came back on and sh- on short notice. And we want to wish you a Merry Christmas. And uh, we, we hope that you enjoy that with your family. Well, thank you. Same to you. Well, Aaron, Brian, you guys got anything else? No, man. Just thanks again for coming on, man. Wonderful, yes, the, wonderful yeah, information. Th- thanks. And, and I do have to say, Brian and I need to make it out to this course this year, too. So I look, look forward Absolutely. to that. Yeah, we've got, uh, we got six advanced instructors uh, in uh, Florida, Arkansas, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, and Arizona in 2021. So you have to make one of them. Awesome. Yeah, nice. I'll, I'll definitely be in one of those advanced um, for sure, Tom. Okay, good deal. Look forward to seeing you there. All right. Thanks again. Have have a good evening, Tom. Have, have a good evening. Good night. All right. Another awesome interview with Tom Givens. That was the second one. Again, just so thankful that he came on. And, and as always, he's entertaining. He's pretty darn funny. But most of all, he has some amazing information to share and, and we just encourage all of you to go check out his classes and, um, and make sure that you find one close to you because his classes from, from basic pistols to, you know, advanced instructor courses, they're just all incredible. And in, in my opinion, they're as good as it gets for the, um, the concealed carry or um, as good as it gets for the civilian uh, defender, so... So you yeah, got and Tom's Tom's not going to teach forever. Get out there and get some, man. That's you definitely want. If you take one, you're going to want more. That's true. Well, and and if I can if I can reiterate, I know um, throughout this episode and and a couple of times recently, he is a phenomenal, amazing instructor. That I, I mean, man, it's just it's hard not to say. Um, say amazing things about Tom and his just his pedagogy um in in defensive pistol shooting is awesome and I'm I'm so pumped I'm still coming down it's been a while since the class now 
and I'm still decompressing and just, you know, writing new notes. And just today I was reading the manual again, and, and, and there's so much in there that I haven't read because we didn't get to go over everything, like Tom mentions in the in the uh, interview. So there's so much value in that. So, yeah, man, amazing, amazing instructor. Folks, seek him out. Yeah. Well, hey, you guys want to chat, have a conversation here about our drill of the week? Eric, what, what was that again? Yeah. Remind us. Yeah, so folks, I'll just hit uh, all, all the highlights real quick. Um, if you want all the details, hit the show notes. We're, we're um, diligent about putting all the details there. So essentially, I chose 50 yards and in because that's what most civilians are going to be able to both get to range-wise and what we're going to see the most of. And I also wanted to keep the round count low, which this is just 21 rounds. So essentially, we've got um, four strings of fire, 50 yards. You're going to fire two shots from standing and, uh, excuse me, two shots kneeling and then two shots from prone. 25 yards, six rounds to the body. you got 10 seconds to do that. String three, 15 yards from low ready. You're going to fire um, one shot to the head, and you get to do that multiple times, actually five times. You know, so you have to repeat a skill. Um, And then at um, string four is seven yards, two shots to the body in 1.5 seconds, three times. And, you know, Tom, Tom formulates his skill set drills or even qualifications with multiple iterations of the same skill because we can always do a skill once really well. But can you repeat that multiple times? So that's kind of why I chose these strings of fire that way. So what did what did you guys think of this particular drill? Well, Eric, I definitely thought that there was enough variety in there to make it entertaining, for one, because that's mm-hmm. part of, you know, we want to do this to be better, but it's got to be fun, too, yeah. you know. And I, I thought that was a fun drill to shoot, personally. Yes. And, you know, I'm going to go and... Uh, so I shot it. I've been dealing with uh, a lot of rough weather up here in the Northwest lately. And of course I'm shooting outdoors and I had a very limited time last weekend to shoot. So I did get, I did get to shoot it, but I grabbed the um, 300 blackout pistol that I built that we've talked about in the oh. past here on the show. Oh, nice. And turns out, <laughs> although I've zeroed that rifle, um, or pistol, excuse me. Um, that, that thing is, uh, I, what I did was like a 20 yard zero might even been 15 because it's kind of meant to be an up close, you know, around the house thing. And what happens at 50 is those, those groups aren't quite where I expected them to be. Now they grouped very well, but some of my shots might've counted out. I looked at where they were grouping versus where I was holding and I was happy with where they were hitting. But so I didn't really get a great, score if you scored it right off the numbers but I was happy with where my hits were and I was happy with how I manipulated the firearm for those drills and I did everything under par everything was easily achievable under par mm-hmm. um, it is mm-hmm. yeah for sure this is not a super push even those ones at the end but funny anecdote I, that's also suppressed so I was having trouble with my shot timer oh, yeah. and now you can go into the menu and turn the sensitivity up and all, but then, you know, you step on a rock or clack or shut your bolt and it, it starts registering, you know, so you have, you know, there's a trade off there if you go to a sensitive. So <laughs> when I got to the end of the drill, the, I've got an M-lock handguard. I actually took the timer and clipped it through the handguard and awesome. was shooting with the timer on the on the forearm and that seemed to work really well so i'm maybe i'll do that again in the future <laughs> that's awesome but, um i will say the uh the two shots in 1.5 seconds most of those were coming off in you know one 1.2 1.3 and i was very happy with how close together they were and that's one of the things that you will notice if you're shooting a, 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 you know, a shorter barrel rifle or a barrel without a proper compensator, those two shots are typically you're going to shoot one and the next one's going to be an inch or an inch and a half higher. With the suppressor on and the fact that it's a 300 blackout um, and it's a well-balanced gun, I've gone through it, 
um, I was getting double taps that were nearly touching. And that was really cool, even Fantastic. though it's close, granted. But, you know, when you try to go fast, oftentimes, especially with 5.56 caliber and, you know, say an A2 flash hider, those are going to come up and to the right 99.9 is what's going to happen when you fire um, fast. So um, keeping control of the muzzle um, is something I've learned to do anyway. So there, that is part of it. But I definitely have a big advantage um, in that platform by running that suppressor. So anyhow, um, shot them all under par. I didn't really score it out, score it out because my groups were definitely off. Uh, my headshots were all neckline, you know, and again, that's just, you know, part of, uh, me re on the rifle. Um, but I was really happy to see that all the shots, you know, even all those, all those shots minus less the 50, the fifties probably had a little bigger spread on them, but everything, the 25 and in everything was, um, you know, inch and a half, two inches or less on uh, those repeated shots. So I was very happy with that. Well, Brian, um, you know, I, I think I use this excuse multiple times. When I don't get the chance to shoot a drill, the beauty of that is I get to prescribe it again. So yeah. I'll, be pres- <laughs> I'll be prescribing this again very soon. I mean, we're yeah. talking just a handful of shows because we might as no. well. And we've talked about that too. And I think that we will implement that more where, you know, if, because these things are all kind of, uh, what do you want to call it? They're like a, a baseline evaluation, right? You shoot it. Yep. How did it go? And you should keep a journal. Aaron showed us his journal earlier, you know, and, uh, absolutely. You, you, I you love have an journals. idea of where you're at and where you're, what your ability is with that drill. And Tom talked about that in the show too. He'll go shoot raw and he'll see where he's at and he'll see what he needs to work on. And then, you know, at, at the end of his training session, he may shoot the drill again to see if he improved or fixed what he was unhappy with. And, you know, these are things that we do, um, you know, in all these drills, I may, I may draw and dry fire at once, or I may just do a couple of draws but every time I do these drills that you prescribe, I shoot them cold because I want to know what my skill set is on the outset, not after having worked on it for an hour. That, that's great, Brian. Cool. Awesome, brother. Yeah. Man, that, so that is you, the Aaron? way to do it. What well, was your experience? Well, man, it, I have to just say that I want to keep doing these carbine drills. For one thing, I have a little bit of ammo for it. And the other thing is I'm just, you know, I hadn't shot carbine uh, much at all until you started prescribing these drills, and I'm just having a blast at it. You and me both lately, honestly. And, and so I, I've been enjoying it a lot. So, yeah, I want to keep it up. So, yeah, ha- had fun with this. Uh, like you said, the, the par times are not that difficult. You know, I, I shot them all under par. So I, I did my normal. I did it three times. I don't need to go into all the details, but, um, one thing that I did this time, I I have to say, so I was running my BCM, which is my, my BCM 14.5, which is my main carbine. And I had my vortex one to six on it. And I actually used some magnification this time. Good. Good for you. It's like, man, not cheating. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So, but the, at the 50 yards, I used it at 4X, which I was trying not to go too far on that, and, and that worked really well. So, again, yeah, I, um, I, I got it all under par, and, and um, the good thing is, I, let me just, full disclosure, I didn't pass any, any of the three times. I was really close, but long story short, I improved each time and, you know, the, the groups were a little bit loose the first time. I was down four points. But then I tightened that up to where I shot it clean on my last time. But I was over par just a bit on that 50-yard section. So that knocked me out of the passing score. But, again, had a blast at it. It was some good skill to work on. Well, Aaron, can I, can I interject a minute? And, and you, can, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, you throughout our time training together, um, your pure focus has been nearly one hundred percent on on pistol. And yes, you shot carbine over the. We've shot drills together. Um, we 
took Travis Haley's course, um, the vehicle carbine darkness class, but um, overall, you don't do a lot of pressure um, carbine stuff, right? Am I yeah. am I correct there? Yeah, that's true. That's true. Mm-hmm. And, and so, so I guess what I'm getting at is, although you, I saw your scores, man, you did awesome. Thank you. Um, I, I guess my point is, is that I guess that's why we should be doing these drills more, is because it causes us to to focus on it. And and I, I have to admit, even though I didn't get to shoot this particular drill, I shot the other carbine drill we we prescribed before moving. And bottom line is, is and, and and I'm not trying to blow smoke. I would count myself as a solid carbine shooter. You know, I've had a lot of training in it. I'm multi, you know, I've had more carbine classes than pistol. Um, you know, I shot expert my whole time in the Army. Never once did I shoot under expert. People in the audience are like, oh, big deal. Well, it's it's not easy. But my point is, is that I have, I have allowed myself to say, oh, I shoot pistol well. And my carbine, I dry fired every now and then. I'll be okay. But, you know, my carbine, I'm starting to stink at carbine. So um, time to police it up. So I'm glad we did this. Well, nice. Fun conversation about that. Do, do you have? Do you want to go ahead and prescribe the next drill? And I'm kind of hoping it's a carbine drill. Well, Aaron, to your chagrin, Poop. it's gonna be a, it's gonna be a pistol. Of course, oh, that's all right. all right. We need to shoot some. Yeah. That's yeah. all right. I, I've got. I'll talk about it, but I'll have my new rig set up tomorrow afternoon. So we'll talk about that on another show. Oh, awesome, cool. Well. Um, Frankly, because we we have had Tom Givens on the show and we spoke to him about recommending this drill the last time we had him on the show. Not only that, Brian reminded him, he's like, hey, let's do the baseline skill set drill, or excuse me, skill assessment. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to do the drill of the month on, excuse me, from the December um, 2020 newsletter. And this is something that that Tom said that he's been prescribing, or at least the last two years. Again, as Brian stated, a assessment of where you are. And so this is, we're going to bring out the B8 bull. So um, you can use any type of B8 repair center, B8 bull, FBI, IP, TAC-1, or the the, uh, Langdon Tactical TAC-1 target. So at five yards, you're going to draw and fire five rounds in five seconds using both hands. That's just a damn good standard. That, that, that's, a, that's a good solid drill. Second string is five yards. Start gun in hand at ready in dominant hand only. Fire three rounds, three seconds. Third string is five yards again. Start gun in hand at ready in dominant hand only. Fire two rounds in three seconds. Seven yards on the next string. Start gun in hand loaded with three rounds only. Fire three rounds. Conduct an empty gun reload and fire three more rounds all in 10 seconds. Next string, 10 yards. Start gun in hand. At ready, four rounds in four seconds. So, again, being a B8 bull, you have a possibility that's 20 rounds, a possible score of 200. So I think that, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm looking at that. That's not an easy one. What do you guys think of that? Well, I'm, and this is just me being optimistic, my plan right now is to shoot a 180 or better, even on my cold string, and then try to shoot a 190 on maybe the second or third go on it. Man, that that's a that's a great goal, Brian. But you know what, man? I'm gonna tell you, man. You do well on these these um, bull drills, man. I'm always proud on proud of you. Excuse me. Um, you you do very well on these B8 um, drills. So, man, I, I, I don't doubt you can do that, man. Hey, Brian, I'm curious. Um, when you're doing most of these drills, are you running Glocks a lot these days? Or oh, what? Yeah, Almost 100%. Sold. Yeah, yeah. So I've been running a 19. Um, I did get um, uh, 
a Gen 5 19X, and I had to play with the sights a little. Of course, everybody thinks a gun comes out of the box and it shoots. We, that's one thing that I negative s- struggle with is <laughs> finding the time to shoot and to tune. <laughs> so um, I've got that one tuned up, and I've been using it and my uh, my daily 19 as well. And that's primarily what I've been doing. I run the 365 on occasion on the shorter drills just to stay, you know, current with that firearm. But yeah, I have been, I have been running Glocks and minus being like cleaned up, maybe a spring change, their stock triggers, stock uh, disconnectors. Oh man, that, that brings up an interesting point, guys. I think I sent you guys some texts about that. So I've got... Um, part of my new rig that I'm working on is a um, Gen 517, and I've been I've been dry firing that, and I was like, man, I am getting some really good trigger pulls on this. I mean, just yeah, static. I saw that earlier. Static um, front side. I mean, just real clean, and and it was because I was able to sink more of my finger on that trigger, and then I would grab my my old competition 17 with an overwatch um, precision trigger in it which is a really cool trigger especially if you don't sink a lot of fingering i mean it really just induces a a rear trigger press but man i I changed my that old 17 back to the stock trigger man i think i'm digging these stock triggers better so and there's definitely, you know, when I get them, usually there's only a couple of things I do and I'll, I may change the reset spring and I may, um, clean up the plunger and potentially change the plunger spring just to smooth up some of that take up, you know, mm-hmm. just to get that stuff cleaner. So that you're not feeling the kind of dunk dunk chunk as you, as you take up the slack Mm -hmm. because a lot of those stock will have, especially when you get back into the gen twos and threes, will have a lot of, you know, you'll feel some stuff happening. They have cleaned that up in the newer versions, but, uh, you know, I'm sitting here trying mine out here. Right. Exactly. Seeing what it's like. (laughs) Cause, uh, the just fancy doesn't mean better. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with those cool triggers. I mean, they're fine. But, you know, as we've talked about, you know, you, they may not be appropriate for carry. So if it's a gun that's for competition, great. But I like to train with the gun I carry. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, and Brian, I, I'd like to comment that. And, and I think I would like to take a little credit for edging Aaron towards getting the Gen 5. Because, yep. Brian, you, you hooked me up through Dusty. Um, with the um, Gen Five Nineteen, man, I, I think I think Glock got it right with that trigger. I, I'm yeah. really impressed with it it's so much so that I'm I'm likely going to be changing my carry um, Nineteen to that Gen Five. And I'm man, I, I hate to say this, I may be selling um, my Gen Threes um, to help pay for Gen Fives for replacement on my other Glocks. It, you know, I'm just I'm digging it that much, frankly. Well, I'll tell you, right so. now is a great time to sell them. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> hey, hey that? I could probably... Dude, they're going I could for call- as much as a 1000 bucks on Gunbroker. This is insane. Yeah, but, <laughs> but yeah guys, that's a good can, point. Can, can you see me trying to pawn that thing off the... <laughs> Yeah, he's <laughs> he's holding his up. the The tenifers coming off the slide, the and <laughs> the home the home stipple job, which is awesome. Yeah. It, but it's yeah, a good stipple job, but you know, the, I don't know many people that would buy that. But so yeah. it, it's like a it's like my whoopee. I, I you know I, I don't think I can let go of that. <laughs> All great. right, guys. Yeah. All right. Well, hey, we Fun. should probably roll into accountability. But yeah, definitely. Uh, very cool getting to shoot those carbine drills, and like we said, we'll we'll be keeping trying to keep carbine in the rotation more yeah, so I, than we have. I, I think I think mm, I was going to say a third, maybe more like twenty thirty percent yeah. of the time. Uh, I think we should at least try to do one a month in carbine. Oh, there, sure. there you go. Yeah. The, the, yeah. yeah, so that put us that put that would put us at um twenty five percent. So yeah, yeah, let's let's do it. Cool. Cool. Well. I'll, we'll kind of keep precedence here, and I'll go ahead and jump in here, and I'll run through this as fast as I can. All right, so again, 
I feel a little bit embarrassed compared to your guys' workouts, but hey, like um, Cecil Birch and Paul Sharp say, just do something, right? So I ha- I did have, you know, being home for the holidays, I got two really long walks in with my wife last week, which was really nice, spending time with her and burning some calories. And just the other night, I got a, a light strength workout, started out with some mobility exercises and, and did some assisted pull-ups, quite a few crunches, some push-ups and some squats. Um, and ended that with a dry fire session. I enjoyed that workout quite a bit, actually. And me and my wife, the other night, got the mats out and spent about an hour or so um, doing some jits together. Get some. Yeah, and my wife's got that new blue belt, and, you know, again, she, <laughs> yeah. she's, yeah, she, she's a good coach. Legit. Yeah, b- blessing to have her right here in the house, so... Now, um, but the bummer is the next day, man, I I can't tell you guys, it's really hard to say either I injured my back or I've got another daggum kidney stone. It's it's really hard to distinguish. Um, But but anyone that's had kidney stones, it it really kind of starts out as back pain. Man, thank God I've had, I think, four of these in my life in about the last 20 years. And mine have not been that bad. But I think I remember Rich Brown feeling like he was dying a few weeks ago. So I'm blessed to not have a major problem with it. But like I said, so I haven't been able to work out since that started bugging me. Kind of a bummer because I was looking forward to doing some jits with my wife every night. But so now on to one kind of fun thing. Um, I've been, I got a new amp modeler called the Iridium. Any of you guitar players out there, and Eric, you'll understand this. This little thing, it fits in the palm of your hand, but it is a um, digital amp modeler. It models speaker cabinets and microphones, and I'm, I'm getting the best guitar sounds that I've ever gotten in recording. And I mean, it's just amazing technology. You cannot tell that I'm not playing through these killer amps that um, that I've put together in a virtual world. So th- that's pretty fun. And I've been recording and writing some new music, which I believe we have a new tune on the um, on the intro of this episode. So check that out. That's man, I can't be- I can't believe we didn't mention that um, at at the intro. That's man. Yeah, that was You'll a fun have to song. Back it up record. and listen again. Yeah, yep, it, it's that's right. It's a pretty rocking tune, and and again, always fun to be able to swap tracks with Eric. And Eric has a new drum kit that man sounds killer. So um, yeah, a lot of fun doing some new music. And man, I think that's it for me, guys. Okay, well I'll pick it up. I uh, got two CrossFit workouts in and a barbell workout. I uh, again. Still dealing with a closed gym. We got word today that they uh, extended our lockdown clear until January 11th now. They just keep throwing it out there. But um, fortunately, I am able to use a facility, not as a group, but um, able to perform programming and and do, do real work. I really encourage anyone in a similar situation, don't don't be idle. Because uh, it's man coming back from a, a long, a long sit spell is not good. But uh, man, really felt good to um, to get that barbell workout in and do some do some real weight. You know, I did a uh, bunch of snatches and some back squats, and you know, it was uh, my shoulders felt it today. But <laughs> I definitely am glad that I did it. Did get uh, two flights in last week, um, which was cool because. With the, the holiday week, I had a little extra time off and was able to get a second day of flying in because with the days so short right now, it is nearly impossible to do anything except on the weekends unless I take time off of work. So it was very awesome to be able to do that. Of course, got the shooting in. Um, have not been doing uh, the dry fire practice that I should. I'm going to get uh, my... Uh, my my designator, my laser designator gun out and, and start doing some more draw practice, uh, in the house so that I can kind of pick that up and stay current on that. Cause that's definitely, 
you know, when that's the other thing is we do some of these carbine drills a few weeks in a row and there you go. I haven't shot my pistol in over 10 days and that's not good. And of course we called me out already. I, I have the access right here, so I definitely need to be doing it. But, uh, that's, that's part of being accountable. Those sharing that and, and, and wanting to move forward. So, um, that's, I think all I'm going to share for this week, man. Good stuff, Brian. Yeah, excellent job, bro. You know, sometimes I'm amazed we all three will beat up on ourselves, but I'm I'm honestly proud of what we get done each week. Not not that, you know, we think we're all that by any stretch, but sometimes we we hold ourselves a little bit too harsh. And so excellent job, both of you. I'm up I'm short on workouts myself this week. I only got one regular workout. Um a mixture of of uh, elliptical sprints, burpees, dumbbell presses, goblet squats with dumbbell crunches and close hand push-ups. You know, sometimes you don't have a lot of time. You set up a six round drill like that. I'm telling you, you're going to smoke yourself. And so that's what I did. And the excitement that I have this week as far as accountability is, is excuse me, is jiu-jitsu. And and I've been visiting a couple of gyms here today. I went to Cornerstone Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Excellent people. They're just really good hearted, humble people. Hell, half the class was um, SF or um, Special Forces soldiers, <laughs> active duty. Great. And I mean, I just excellent people. And most most folks will know that that those guys are they're just humble, you know. And so that was a lot of fun, and and that that I think is a place that I might be able to find some weapons based training partners. What what would you guys think? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I'm I'm pretty pumped about that. Um, that th- I am settling towards that gym drill of the week. Again, I didn't get the live fire, but I did dry fire it. I also had a lot of fun with the um, Range Master Bullseye um, course that's that's in the manual that I got from the, the class. And I think it may be in concealed carry class, I, I, I do believe. You know, some of it's even super slow fire. That's just a good dry fire drill. And I got a lot of video review. And I was texting back and forth with Ryan. Um another dude I miss from Washington. And uh, he, he said he had been doing a lot of video review, and, and I had as well. It's like, folks in the audience, if you're not using video review, I'm not perfect at it, but when I do, I realize, again, I wrote a blog post several months ago about the importance uh, of using visualization and video. And I've been watching the John Danaher strangle and turtle breakdown videos. Amazing content. It's key work. So, um, man, just that that to me is one of the best ways to learn. And, again, you, you see it in video. It's a repetition for yourself. Your brain sees it as a repetition. So add that to your, your own training if you're not doing it. Well, guys, with that said, I think I think that does it for me. We've kind of went a little bit long, but we've had a good time, don't you all think? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. And the, go ahead, Brian. Sorry. No, Aaron, I was just going to point out, um, I forgot to mention earlier when you said you didn't get the part time on the 50-yard um, burpees. Burpees will help you get to that prone position quicker. Oh, that's a good that's a good point. <laughs> yeah. awesome, I know man. you're you're razzing me, but at the same time, yeah, that that makes sense. Um, yeah, the funny- I do so many burpees that throwing my legs out and getting into that prone position is just like automatic. That, yeah, that, yeah. You know, burpees I, are awesome for that. That's something I can dry fire to that uh, here in the house. So, um, awesome point too. Well. I wanted to say that this has been a fantastic episode with Tom, and I've had a blast chatting with you guys um, tonight. As so, always. Yeah, I, I don't know why, but it's maybe it's because we haven't got to hang out as much on these on these chats. 
is just a little extra fun. And maybe it's because of the laid back nature of, of the holidays. So hope you guys are having happy holidays. I know I am. Yep. Same here. Well, Hey, well, we'll catch you guys next time. All right. You guys be blessed, man. Have a happy new year. All right. We'll see, we'll see you next year. Thank you.